gravitational force and an inertial force. And so this plumb bob at 45 degrees, uh, which is close to where we are, uh, hangs slightly towards the equator by an angle that's about a tenth of a degree. And if the equivalence principle is exact, that angle is going to be the same no matter what you hang from the pendulum. But if the equivalence principle is violated, if the inertial and gravitational masses are not the same, then this angle is going to be slightly different for different materials. And of course, you don't do it this way. What you do is you hang two bobs uh, from a bar, okay? And if they hang at different angles, okay, then the bar is going to try to twist until it, it, it sits so that both of these uh, objects are, uh, you know, pointing in the same direction, okay? Now, the point is, uh, the way to get something that you can detect is you have to very carefully rotate the apparatus about the axis of this fiber, okay? And then what happens is you'll see that the bar has a twist that's correlated with the angle that you have this. If you rotate this by 180 degrees, the, twist the change in the twist angle is the signal, okay? And the, the cartoon makes some important points. The, this beam only twists if the force vectors are not parallel, okay? That's the reason you can do something so precise. It's, it's, a, it's, it's something that's exceedingly sensitive to these angles, okay? And that will happen if the equivalence principle is violated or if the gravity field is not uniform. And that's a very important point because uh, no gravitational field is exactly uniform. And uh, here's a general moral. Okay? These kind of experiments are almost never limited by the ability to measure tiny forces on test bodies, but rather by the ability to ensure that gravity is the only force acting on the test bodies and by the ability to accurately model the actual gravitational force acting on the test bodies. And some relevant scaling laws here for such uh, torsion balance experiments, small is good, okay? If you have a detector of mass M and inertia I suspended from a fiber of diameter D, any new physics torque is proportional to the mass you hang on it. The thermal torque noise power goes like the uh, loss, the, the suspend the kappa, the storing uh, force of the torsion fiber divided by the Q, the quality factor of the oscillator. The uh, restoring uh, force is proportional to the fourth power of the diameter, while the mass you can suspend is proportional to the square of the diameter, so that the uncertainty in the torque, okay, due to thermal noise, goes like one over the mass you can hang and gravity gradients favor small sizes as well. But too small is not so good because fractional accuracy of the test bodies decreases and electrical effects are often surface effects. Brief history uh, in, in the uh, early century, uh, Etwash watched things falling in the Earth's field and turned the balance manually. In the 50s and 60s, Dickey and later Braginsky watched things falling toward the sun and let the Earth's rotation turn their instruments. This was clearly an improvement because trying to manually turn something uh, that's as delicate as you can make is obviously a problem. But from 1950s on, 85 onward rather, uh, we watched things fall in the fields of the Earth, the Sun, the galaxy, and in the rest frame defined by the cosmic microwave background using balances on high performance turntables. Uh, this is just shows you at Bush's experiment. He had uh, two test bodies, one here and one there, and he uh, looked at uh, the angle of the uh, that this torsion pendulum made, uh, and he claimed uh, it was remarkable that all things fell with the same acceleration to uh, a few parts in a billion. Okay. Now you can see this is sort of a, not an ideal instrument because this is gonna be sensitive to gravity gradients. Uh, in fact, the instrument was originally a gravity gradiometer, but Edvush realized that this was such a powerful idea that even though he had a gradiometer, he could make an, a huge improvement in the precision of the EP test. And Dickey and later against the, here's Dickey's apparatus watching things fall towards the sun. There's the sun. He has two big aluminum weights compared to a gold weight falling towards the sun. And he did it about 280 times better than that version. He was surprised that it wasn't even better, okay? 
And uh, this is what uh, we were shown in Seattle in 1985, okay? Fishbach went back and plotted Etvish's data on differential accelerations of materials versus the baryon number per AMU uh, that these different materials uh, contained. And he discovered there was this striking correlation, okay? And he claimed this was evidence for a new force that coupled to baryon numbers, okay? And uh, that it had a range uh, between 30 meters and 1,000 meters. Uh, that's because he was also looking at some other uh, data from gravity and mines. And because this uh, range was so much shorter than the distance to the sun, it never would have been seen by uh, Dickey or Brzezinski, okay? And uh, so this now m m uh, pushed a new way to think about EP tests, okay? They're a broad gauge way to search for ultra feeble long range quantum exchange forces that may lie hidden underneath gravity. And uh, this is a little bit outdated slide, but uh, we formed a group uh, to test uh, the, the, these ideas uh, and improve the technology of uh, torsion balances. And uh, we also po pointed out a, the, the right way to think about this, okay? Uh, you know, gravity couples to mass, but quantum exchange forces don't couple to mass, they couple to charge, some generalization of the charge, okay? And uh, so, and they, uh, if the exchange boson has a mass, uh, non-zero, then uh, you'll get this exponential factor here, okay? So when you combine the gravitational interaction, which you can never switch off, and uh, this one boson exchange potential, you get you can write it this way: uh, the Newtonian term plus the term that is due to quantum exchange. Okay, and alpha here is a, a dimensionless number. Okay, and these are the charge to mass ratios. Okay, uh, because. Uh, the charge to mass ratios because we're weighting everything by the masses here from the Newtonian thing, okay? Now, and then another thing we did was say, look, you can think about any test body that's electrically neutral and stable is made up of a certain number of hydrogens and a certain number of neutrons plus the binding energy that holds the whole thing together, okay? And the most general vector charge of electrically neutral objects then is going to be something that is proportional to the number of hydrogens, if you like, uh, plus something proportional to the number of neutrons in the test body. And then there's this parameter psi, which we have no idea what it is. We want to be perfectly general, so we just let that run anywhere between uh, pi over two and minus pi over two. This uh, parameterization points out that you need at least two test body pairs and two attractors to avoid possible accidental cancellations because there's always some value of tangent uh, psi where uh, this charge vanishes or the differential charge vanishes. And we need sensitivity to a wide range of length scales. You don't want to use the sun as a tractor because everything shorter than an AU is invisible to you, okay? And furthermore, you need a site with interesting topography because if the force has a very short range, small compared to the size of the Earth, okay, the Earth is basically a gravitational potential under its rotation. And if there's a short range force, it simply pulls down perpendicular and there is no force. So you want to go someplace where there's topography. So you're sensitive to a force. You get a sideways tug. And, you know, we tried that uh, we could go to the Grand Canyon, uh, but you know, it turns out the best thing you can do is stay on campus in a lab carved out of a, hymns, out of a hillside beside a deep lake. Modest topology, but very good experimental conditions. And so here's the UW uh, from some years ago. It's an old photograph, and our lab is somewhere over here. And uh, we uh, use the spherical multipole formalism to understand uh, the gravity gradients, okay? And how to minimize the pendulums to the gradients, how to build devices that measure the gradients and how to def uh, design efficient gradient compensators. Th this shows the torsion pendulum of our uh, equivalence principle test. Uh, 
it hangs from a meter long fiber that you can barely see here, okay? There are eight test bodies, four of them of one kind, four of them of another, and uh, four mirrors that we can use to measure the twist angle. And this thing here just is uh, designed to catch the detector pendulum in case there's a tiny earthquake and this fiber breaks because it's, you know, it's just about to break, right? And the point is that this has a, uh, like a millihertz free oscillation period, a Q, a quality factor of about 4,000, it's about 70 grams. And this hangs from a turntable that rotates with a 20 minute period. Big advantage, the signal is boosted from a one day period to much lower noise regions. Disadvantage, the turntable must be very good. And I mean, constant rotation rate and the rotation axis must coincide with down at the pendulum CM. In other words, not down, down here is a different direction than down a meter below, okay? And so it's an air bearing turntable. Uh, we have, it rests on feet whose temperatures are co uh, controlled to keep the turntable rotation axis level. And th these are the gradiometer pendulums that we use to measure the gravity gradients, okay? This is the leading term of the gravity gradient. You put this thing in, that's what's called a 2-1 two, two, multiple. And uh, this is for a higher uh, multiple, okay? So we first cancel the leading term, put up some masses, uh, and you, me you measure the gradient and you see something like this, okay? Uh, th this is two complete rotations of the turntable and you see this uh, sinusoidal thing. That's the measuring basically the gradient, okay? And uh, then we uh, put up, we calculate what mass do you have to put up to cancel that gradient right here at that spot. It doesn't cancel it anywhere else. It cancels it right here, okay? And then once you've got this right, then you uh, put up some masses to cancel the next term in the gradient and so on, okay? So this is a very sophisticated process. Uh, but uh, it has a flaw in it, okay? Uh, when one student was finishing her thesis on this, uh, after she was through, I said, Sue, let's go and look and see what the gradient, uh, if it's canceled as well as we uh, had done it originally. And then the uh, first uh, measurement we made, that was acceptable. But then as we took more and more of these measurements, the gradient was changing right in front of our noses, okay? The data were taken in early November. Uh, early November is the time the monsoon starts, so to speak. And it turned out it was rainwater soaking in the ground, okay? Uh, so we can't stop the weather, but we can tune away the residual gradient. So we had in these things here, we had eight tiny, tiny screws, okay? That we could drive back and forth and we could take the gradient compensators, rotate them 180 degrees, about the fiber axis. So instead of canceling the gradient, they add it to the gradient. And then we adjust these little tiny screws to make this object as insensitive to that gradient as you can. Now, this requires a patient grad student with good hands to do it because these are tiny, tiny adjustments. And here are the data. Uh, this is the twist, the power and the uh, spectral density of the twist angle. And you see here at a little more than a millihertz, there's the peak. That's the free resonance of the torsion pendulum, okay? And this curve right here, the area under that curve is KT, okay? So we're really seeing the thermal noise, the KT noise in this device sitting on a turntable, uh, a 70 gram object sitting on a turntable, okay? These peaks uh, are at uh, the turntable rotation frequency twice three times, six times, okay, and so on, okay. The, the, the signal that we expect from the violation of the equivalence principle is right here. We see something, okay. But that is, uh, turns out it's not a violation of the principle of equivalence. This is due to the fact that even that super duper turntable isn't perfect, okay. And there is gonna be a small uh, imperfection that gives you a signal right here. So what you do is you rotate the top of the fiber, the suspension fiber, 180 degrees once a day uh, so that the sign of a, a, a real equivalence principle violating effect would change sign, but the uh, sign of the signal due to a turntable imperfection would be unaffected by this, okay? So by that means, we can subtract away the imperfections in the turntable. 
And uh, uh, th 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 these now show the results from this experiment uh, where we looking things falling in the north direction, uh, in the west direction. These are differential accelerations in, uh, in meters per, per uh, second squared, okay? This is the acceleration uh, towards the sun. This is acceleration towards the center of the galaxy. Okay? And you see these are all like uh, you know, femtometers per second squared accelerations. Okay? And uh, these, th th these are tiny numbers, okay? Tiny numbers. And uh, I, now I'll just tell you some of the implications of measuring these tiny tiny effects, okay? The first is just a simple thing. You uh, say, suppose there is some uh, interaction, let's say coupled to B minus L, baryon number minus lepton number. That's an interesting uh, quantum number because it's conserved in grand unified theories, okay? And uh, these are the regions that we have constrained uh, from our measurements. This shows the range on a log scale versus the dimensionless coupling constant, whoops, the dimensionless coupling constant in the vertical axis, okay? And here are the uh, Dickey's uh, experiment, lunar laser ranging, uh, Braginsky's experiment. And, and you see, we've excluded a tremendous region, a, a, a parameter space. And uh, this is, uh, sh shows an, another feature. It's any one experiment with a single uh, composition dipole and a single attractor, such as Dickey's or Braginsky's, is going to be completely insensitive at two values of this mixing angle. But because we had multiple, uh, we, we used beryllium and, uh, and titanium and beryllium and aluminum, uh, these poles disappear. They're, they're canceled out. And so that, that we're sensitive everywhere. Uh, one of the interesting things we could do, this was originally suggested to us by Christopher Stubbs, is uh, watch things fall towards the center of our galaxy and see uh, if we can test whether the only long range force between dark and luminous matter is gravity. In other words, is the force between dark and luminous matter uh, obey the equivalence principle? Gravity uh, appears to obey the equivalence principle very, very precisely, okay? So here's a cartoon. Here's our galaxy, okay, uh, rotating as shown here. And we're out, here's the University of Washington, and a, roughly a third of the, a quarter to a third of the dark matter, okay, uh, it, 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 it is uh, inside our radius, okay? And so uh, the acceleration that uh, we see towards the center of the galaxy, that just given by knowing the uh, r distance from the center of the galaxy and the period for one complete rotation around the center of the galaxy uh, is you know, substantial compared to our precision, right? And uh, the acceleration that's due to the dark matter uh, is substantial compared to our precision, okay? So by watching different things towards, fall towards the center of the galaxy, we can see whether or not the equivalence principle holds for ordinary matter falling toward dark matter. And this shows uh, the results from uh, three experiments, our two experiments here and lunar laser ranging uh, plotted against this charge parameter, which remember runs between minus 90 and 90 degrees. And this is the 95% confidence limits on possible non-gravitational acceleration of hydrogen by the galactic dark matter. And you see that, uh, you know, at most 6% of the total acceleration of dark, of neutral hydrogen by, caused by the dark matter could be non-gravitational. That's a, quite an interesting result because, you know, it didn't have to be that way. It could be that there was a long range interaction between dark matter and luminous matter. Uh, we could also make a statement about the gravitational properties of antimatter. Uh, there are people who suggest that antimatter could fall up with acceleration minus g. They uh, propose to test this by dropping antihydrogen. This is a very, very difficult experiment. But how plausible is the scenario? 
if antimatter falls up, photons, their own antiparticles shouldn't fall. Well, we know that photons uh, fall just right from a whole bunch of things like the Cassini mission, uh, you know, me measuring the, uh, the propagation of uh, microwaves uh, as they get from Saturn as they pass close to the sun. The photons uh, are, are delayed by just the amount that they should be, according to Einstein. Even uh, more uh, interesting, perhaps, nucleons have 99% of their mass consisting of glue and only 1% a glue and anti-glue, and only 1% uh, consists of, is matter, okay? And so they should fall with 100 times less acceleration than electrons if, uh, because electrons, their, their mass is entirely mass, okay? There's no, uh, so uh, th th this is clearly not uh, tenable. Uh, it, in other words, if gravity, if hydrogen and antihydrogen fell with different accelerations, gravity must have a vector component, which changes sign from particles to antiparticles. And now consider an EP test with hydrogen and antihydrogen. This has this delta Z of two, Z over mu. Our beryllium uh, aluminum test has delta Z over two of, you know, 0 0.0382. But on the other hand, we can do that experiment super precisely, and we see no evidence for such an interaction uh, with delta G over G greater than uh, parts in 10 to the 13th. I, there is a newer experiment uh, in space that has now exceeded the precision of our older uh, equivalence principle test. Uh, they were watching things fall in orbit, okay? And as the, as the satellite went, went, went around the or, uh, orbited the Earth, the uh, equivalence principle violating test would have a sinusoidal behavior here. It was a very uh, well-conceived experiment. Uh, they had only one uh, composition dipole and they were insensitive to ranges less than the uh, altitude of the orbit, but it was a beautiful experiment. And uh, this shows you the constraints putting together everything I've told you about uh, on um, uh, on possible new Yukawa forces. These constraints sh shown here are coming from the next set of experiments I'll be discussing, tests of the inverse square law, and these are equivalence principle tests. Okay. It's interesting that uh, so far we've been talking about what's called the weak equivalence principle. That says that all objects fall with exactly the same acceleration if you can neglect their gravitational, the gravitational binding energy in them, okay? In other words, it's check. It says we can test that everything obeys the equivalence principle except for gravitational energy itself, okay? And that's an interesting thing because that's a nonlinear property of gravity, okay? And uh, that uh, it was, was tested recently in a very lovely experiment uh, on a triple star system, okay? There was a white dwarf, with 1.4 solar masses, a white, a very low mass white dwarf, okay, uh, with a very short period, okay, and a millisecond pulsar, a neutron star, and the neutron star is so dense that gravitational binding energy makes up a tenth of its mass, okay. So now gravitational binding energy has got to, is a huge effect, okay, uh, and uh, in that case, uh, this system, you can time the neutron star, that's, that's your observable, it's the, this radio beam is whipping around, okay, you time them on Earth uh, from a whole, from a radio telescope, and you measure the arrival times of the pulses, and you can, you do this for six years of data, you learn everything about the orbit, and you can do this well enough so that you can test the gravitational self-energy obeys the equivalence principle at this level, you know, parts per million. It's a, it's a lovely experiment, okay? So again, Einstein has come out correct. I want to switch gears now. Uh, we want to uh, discuss uh, testing the inverse square law at short distances. It's interesting because there is a length scale associated with the dark energy density, okay? 
it turns out to be about 85 microns. Uh, and it would be, uh, it's also, you know, we should check that gravity behaves at this properly at this length scale. Also, what's really motivating us originally was to search for new phenomena associated with unification of gravity and particle physics. String theories for, uh, of unification, presently the only game in town, require extra curled up space dimensions, extra nominally gravitationally coupled bosons, dilatons, moduli, radions, possible heavy gravitons, etc. Okay. We, we, you should also check it just because who knows? I mean, it's never been done before, okay? But in all of these cases, uh, the, the effects you expect to show up first as Yukawa interactions, Yukawa modifications of the inverse square law. This clearly is the result for quantum exchange forces from boson exchange. If you have large extra dimensions, okay, as I will point this argument out, uh, the, the gravitational uh, potential should change from one over R to one over R to the one plus N, where N is the, is the number of extra, large extra dimensions, okay? This is a particularly intriguing idea. It was due to Arkani, Hamed, Demopoulos, and Diwali. If some of the string theory's extra dimensions are large, it could explain why gravity is so weak, okay? Because most of its strength has leaked off into places we cannot go, okay? String theory is not only a theory of strings, you know, one-dimensional objects, it's also a string of higher, uh, a theory that has higher dimensional objects, such as a brain, okay, which you think of as a, as a surface here. And the standard model particles uh, are all open strings that have some charges on their ends. And these charges stick them tightly to the brain. So this brain, as you should imagine, is the world we inhabit, okay, everything we, Everything in the universe except gravity is stuck on this brain, okay? The graviton alone is a closed string, okay? It doesn't have any ends, and so it can go everywhere, okay? And so the idea is that if you had two extra large extra dimensions, you could explain the weakness of gravity uh, just by uh, it has, uh, because that's because enough of it has leaked off of this brain. Uh, so that you could make the mass scale of gravity instead of the Planck scale be a TV type scale, okay? So this is a very interesting idea. And here's the cartoon that shows that this is one of our dimensions. We are stuck on this line, okay? We stick a point mass here and we take a second point mass and we see what happens as we move along this line. This is the uh, one of the curled up dimensions, okay? And the, the, this, these colored lines here show the lines of gravitational force that behave just like uh, you, you expect, you know, they repel each other, they don't like to bend, etc. And you see that in close, you have, you'd see uh, Gauss's law in one dimension here, I mean, in two dimensions here. And when you get out farther, you have Gauss's law in one dimension, in other words, a constant force law. This shows you how the previous uh, tests of the inverse square law worked, okay, uh, by Riley Newman at uh, Irvine. Uh, he had a test mass, a cylindrical test mass inside a very long cylinder, and if the inverse square law is correct, uh, this test mass shouldn't feel a, any force as you move it uh, back and forth inside this long cylinder, okay. This shows the device that we use, okay. You see it's entirely different, okay. We have a pendulum hanging here. It has a plate uh, with uh, two sets of 21 holes in it. And underneath is a rotating plate with two sets of 21 holes, okay? And if there weren't any holes in this plate or, or in that plate, uh, then as you rotate the plate underneath, gravity would simply continue to pull down on the object. Because of the holes, there's a sideways component to gravity between these two. And if you rotate this detractor one complete revolution, the uh, torque on this pendulum will twist it back and forth 21 times, okay? And there's a little trick, there's a plate underneath the, in the attractor, there's a, a second plate which is thicker with bigger diameter holes, and that's designed to cancel roughly the gravitational force on these little set of holes and uh, the normal Newtonian force, but it won't cancel some new physics because this part of the attractor is simply too far away to uh, have much effect. Okay. And very importantly, there's a very tightly stretched copper foil, gold-coated copper foil, 
between these two, okay? And this separation is much smaller than shown there. Uh, these are hard experiments. Uh, the force is terribly weak. The alignment is really tricky. Unshielded backgrounds are enormous. Cleanliness is essential. Uh, and here's Dan Kapner uh, working on this thesis experiment. And that's a picture uh, of the torsion pendulum, Kapner's torsion pendulum, uh, with the electrostatic shield removed and the vacuum vessel uh, taken away and everything. It's a beautiful thing. Everything's coated with gold for electrostatic reasons. And this just shows you the, uh, what the turntable looks like that, uh, what, or the attractor. And these, this shows the constraints that uh, have come from the, the uh, what's our knowledge of what happens at short lambdas, okay? Again, I'll remind you, this is gravitational strength. At this point, you're seeing the strength of gravity, okay? Uh, our newest uh, test uh, uses what we call the Fourier vessel geometry, okay? That is uh, optimized uh, for short distance exper uh, experiments. You can't use the um, multiple formalism because you have to be able to put a sphere around one object uh, not including any other for the multiple expansion to converge. This uh, expansion converges if you can put a plane between the two objects. And uh, these uh, patterns uh, turn out to be optimal. The, 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 this, this outer pattern has 18 holes, the inner pattern has 120 holes, and this shows the torque that you expect from gravity as a function of the separation between the test body faces. Okay, the signal of the 18 um, omega signal, the, the, the 120 omega Newtonian signal, and then these dash curves show the effect of an additional Yukawa interaction. Okay, but, but this is a very uh, a lovely design, uh, many beautiful properties. This shows a picture, uh, a, not a picture, but a computer rendering, rendering of the pendulum. This separation, again, is much bigger than we'd ever use. This is just so you can see what the patterns look like. Here are the cut out of a, a pl thin platinum foil, 50 microns thick, glued to a glass plate to keep it flat, and then everything is coated with gold. And uh, this shows the foil that separates the pendulum from the attractor, and there's a house that sits around everything with just a little hole here for the torsion fiber and another little hole for the light that shines off the, the autocollimator that measures the twist angle. Okay. And this is a simulation that, that Ted Cook made. Uh, you see the attractor turning around. It's speeded up by a factor of a thousand. Okay. And this is the torque that you see. This low frequency sine wave comes from the 18 holes, and the high frequency sound wave, I mean the sine wave, comes from the 120 uh, fold pattern, okay? And uh, because you have, in, in the absence of, uh, you know, in just uh, ordinary gravity, you have two falling exponentials with well-known decay rates, okay, determined strictly by the geometry here, so that makes you less sensitive to knowing exactly where zero separation is, okay? Everything has to be aligned uh, uh, very accurately. The horizontal alignments are made to plus or minus two micrometers, okay? Simply using gravity between the, um, the, t the uh, gravity signal, uh, maximizing the gravity signal. The vertical separation is a more, a more difficult, actually. We measure that by the electrical capacitance between the detector and the screen as a function of separation and the attractor to the screen as a function of separation. And you see, again, we, we measure these to better than one micron. But then we have to correct also for the uh, foil that lies in between. Uh, this shows the scale of the apparatus. Here's uh, John Lee, whose thesis experiment this was. He's checking for magnetic systematics. These uh, three spheres here are rotating around on their own turntable and they interact with the three spheres here on top of the pendulum to make a gravitational hexadecapole uh, calibration force. And uh, the systematic errors here were turned out to be dominated by the, uh, uh, the fact that the Earth's field uh, penetrated our shields uh, and uh, it slightly polarized the, uh, 
the platinum test bodies. Uh, and so uh, our Fourier vessel expansion allowed us to calculate that with just one overall normalization. Uh, and again, we understand that very, very well. And it turns out that the only significant correction was for the high frequency torque, the 120 omega, which required a 1% correction. We use an unusual method for analyzing things uh, because we, we have to use gravity itself to calibrate this, things. So we can do that better than you can mechanically. And uh, we, the chi-squared has a component uh, due to, uh, we let the experimental parameters float within the constraint how well are they measured externally, okay? And uh, this way, the systematic errors are incorporated in our chi-squared fit in a, a lovely way. This shows the uh, results. The Newtonian fit is excellent. Here's the 120 signal, the 18 signal, okay? The, har the third harmonic of the 18, okay? Uh, with the log scale of the separation and the linear scale on the torques. A, the, the scale, this is one femta Newton meter, okay? That is the weight of a single E. coli cell placed at the end of a massless 10 centimeter long lever arm. The error bars here are equivalent to 100th the weight. So these are really tiny forces, okay? Uh, this shows the constraints that were added uh, by John Lee's experiment here. It doesn't look like much in this dimension, but if you go in the vertical direction, it's an order of magnitude improvement here. And uh, we can, as a result of this, we can say that a dilaton, that's the, the scalar partner of the graviton, the tensor graviton, if you like, a dilaton or heavy graviton must have a mass bigger than 5.1 milli electron volts. The largest extra dimension, a single largest extra dimension has to have a radius less than 30 microns. Two large extra dimensions, that this is what would give you a gravity at the TeV scale. A plant, effective plant mass of the TV scale, the, the radius has to be less than 26 micrometers. So to conclude, a, a famous European theorist, whom I have unfortunately forgotten, once compared theorists to French farmers who lead pigs to places where they can dig up truffles. Guess who were the pigs in this clever analogy? Ha ha. But one of the pigs pointed out a problem with this clever analogy. The farmer only needs, leads his pigs to places where he knows there actually are truffles. So we've tried very hard to find some evidence that Einstein's uh, uh, old theory of gravity breaks down. So far, despite much experimental effort, all of us have been entirely unsuccessful. The score is Einstein four, experimenter zero. Thank you very much. And I would be happy to uh, stop the sharing and uh, answer any questions. So thanks very much, Eric, as always. And hear so, you, Keith. Yes, wonderful. It's a wonderful talk, as always. So, um, Keith, I'll, I cannot hear you. Okay, so I'll let someone else. I'll let someone else take over. Keith, can he hear? Can Eric hear anyone? <laughs> Good question. Can you hear anyone? <laughs> Eric, can you hear me? So can anybody hear me? Yes. I can't hear anyone. Right. Maybe people could put questions in the chat. I can't oh, hear. To let can you know. hear? We can hear you. Yes. Yes. We can hear you. You can hear? Yes. I cannot hear you. We know that. <laughs> we know that. I, I, I cannot hear. Maybe he's, uh, he's unmuted his loudspeaker. Yeah, since we can hear him, it's probably something he's done. It's my guess. Okay, I can hear you. Oh, great. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Fortunately, we heard you, Eric. Okay. <laughs> yes, we clapped. I'm sorry about the delay getting started, so I had to go very fast to try to get through it. Are there any 
next generations of these experiments coming up using atomic interferometry or anything? Well, it, it's, it, it's going to be hard to do a lot better. Um, obviously, there are other techniques uh, that, that, that are available, but, but the experiments are going to be challenging no matter which way you try. <laughs> I, I'm uh, in conversations with uh, Marcus Aspelmeyer in uh, Vienna about uh, trying to do new generations of things. Uh, but the, um, you know, we are actually limited by vibrations. So if you just went to a quiet place, the inverse square law could get, could get, uh, you know, significantly better. Okay. The problem is that the uh, when you get the pendulum uh, close to the attractor, uh, when it gets very close, within uh, you know 40 microns or so, you see extra noise. Okay, uh, it's no longer thermal, and it, it's due to the fact that a conduct. It's called a patch effect. A, 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 you know, a, a, even a perfectly clean conductor made out of microcrystalline materials is going to have a potential that varies across the surface simply because the work functions from the little crystal faces uh, are, di are, are different. In other words, given material off of one crystal face, the work function is different than off of another. And so when you take that effect, uh, that there's this complicated electrostatic potential, and uh, now you have things moving around because of the uh, vibration, okay, moving this way or that way, uh, you, you, that makes uh, uh, extra noise, okay? That li it also limits how close you can get because if the pendulum bounces up and down, it will sometimes touch, in which case, you know, boom, it's, it's all over until you can fix that. So, um, you know, vibrations are going to be a problem. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the trouble with, uh, inter uh, with interfer uh, atom interferometers is uh, that the atoms are actually highly polarizable. Uh, that's uh, why you use them. Uh, that's how the laser talks to them. And um, so, you know, they, they, they have their own I I I issues. Um, I, I think, you know, Holger Miller at, at Berkeley has some nice ideas where you actually, instead of letting the atoms you know, rise and fall, and you, you, you trap them uh, at a certain level. That's certainly going to be um, good for uh, equivalence principle type tests because, you know, shooting something up a 10 meter tower and going down, the gravity gradient problem is enormous. Okay. I mean, you have to know the gravity gradient everywhere in this 10 meter thing. Whereas if you can just float the, uh, the atoms, uh, hold them in a trap, that should be better. So yes, I expect to see improvements, but it isn't going to be. It isn't going to be. You know, it's going to be a challenge for anybody. I like John Harris's. <laughs> hey Eric, thanks. I see you a little bit later, but I maybe I have a question and. Um, so do you see uh, any future possibilities of looking at the inverse square law at less than, what, 25 microns? Or I don't remember what the limit was. I know you said for, for um, extra dimensions right. well, to get down there right. to the Planck scale. But, um, I mean, 25 microns still seems kind of large to me. Yeah, it seems large until you try to do the experiment, okay? <laughs> because uh, if you don't have a conducting foil between the attractor and the detector, electrically conducting foil, a rigid uh, electrically conducting foil, uh, you're, you're, it's going to be very hard uh, to uh, convince uh, someone that you're actually seeing gravity. It just, you know, 
the electrical forces are so enormous compared to uh, gravity that uh, you 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 gotta shield them. So that you know that sets a, a, a sort of an irreducible minimum. I mean, is that just with that technique, or I, so now I'm thinking, you know, coming from particle nuclear physics, there must be some way to test it at smaller sizes. Yeah, well, you could imagine, you know, having uh, traps that trap uh, trap things, uh, but you really would like to have. Um, yeah, the because they're polarizable, you know, if you trap cesium, you, you've got two polarizable objects, there's going to be the, the chasm air force and everything else uh, operating between them, right? And as you get closer and closer, the chasm air force gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, you should, you should never say that something's not going to be done because people are clever and, you know, <laughs> Uh, but I'm just saying it's not it's not an easy thing to do better. Yeah, it doesn't sound like your experiments are easy either. So no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess then uh, the hour is late. I don't see any hands raised. If anyone had a, a, a urgent question you wanted to ask and uh, butt in and ask it now. Otherwise, we'll thank Eric again. Thank you very much, Eric, for uh, agreeing to give our colloquium. And um, um, I look forward to, uh, it, I have a, a, a slot to meet with you right right in about a few minutes. So if that's OK, um, yes. if, if you're up to it, OK. Yeah, I, I'm up to it. So and do we I'll just stay on the Zoom? I here. suppose we could do it that way as well. So how are you doing? Yeah. Um, okay, we can do it that way. So thank you all for joining. And yeah, well, thank you for your attention. So um, yes, so Eric, I wanted to ask you, you made an intriguing comment uh, uh, about interference between gravity and maybe a, a fifth force is, or, or uh, for example, or, or mm -hmm. some, some you call a coupling, but it, it was the interference, um, uh, you know, you showed, um, uh, it was, I, I, I didn't write down the, the slide number. Is there a paper that you can, can uh, direct me to that uh, explains that? Is it one of your papers or, or, uh, or another yeah. one? Yeah, Keith, just so I understand, I mean, there's a general paper that's in the, a review article I wrote uh, in uh, Progress in Particle and Nuclear Physics. Uh, I can, uh, yeah. If you click on, the, you know, my faculty page in the UW thing, it has my uh, CV, and you can see it was, uh, it was in particle progress in particle nuclear physics. It, it, it goes through, it's a review uh, that uh, the very good, but but, okay. but it's. It, it's uh, it, it's it, it's not interference in the strictly quantum mechanical uh, sense. Uh, in, in other words, the the potential has two terms, but the the, the, the source of the two terms is different. It, you know, it, it's the mass in one and it's this charge in, in another. Yeah. So, uh -huh. yeah. And and so the charge meaning whether it's attractive or repulsive at some level. Yeah, if it's a vector interaction, it's like electromagnetism. Okay, yeah. like charges repel, opposite charges attract. Okay. Yeah. If it's a scalar interaction, then it's just the other way around. 
like ch uh, charges attract, opposite charges repel. Okay. 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 I'll read it. I did not. I have not read that your, your review article. So, uh, but, but that's the, 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 you know. And the other thing is that the vector charge of a particle and an antiparticle are opposite. The scalar charge of a particle and an antiparticle are the same. I mean, mm -hmm. so they they, they have really scalars and vectors have just about exactly opposite kind of properties. Okay. Good. All right. Yeah. I yeah. I I obviously. Um, don't have well thought out ideas, uh, but uh, this question, but th this is fine. I'll read your article and that'll help. Okay, great. Um, I see some other people are still here. If you wanted to ask questions, I, I can yield some of my time. I, I um, uh, Eric has answered my question now, so. Yeah, I'd be happy. Uh, otherwise, I've, I'm going to sit around here waiting for, uh, you know, for 40 minutes for the next person. Yeah. I think John also said that he would, would yield some of his time, um, uh, in, in John Harris. So I, I don't know. Is the timing of these uh, others uh, flexible here, uh, Keith? Well, they, the, the, the schedule you have is the same one I have. So they'll, they'll contact, they'll uh, uh, Zoom you at the appropriate time that's a start. But you, if uh, I let you off early, then you can go and take a break before your next one, uh, before your next meeting. So that's probably what I'll do. But so uh, I didn't know if anyone, Stan or Tom, uh, if you wanted to ask a question. Uh, here is Stan. I, I, uh, I have a long standing question in my mind. Uh, why is gravity so weak? Um, and um, I wonder if the speaker has any uh, intuitions concerning the, the, this extremely small magnitude. Well, uh, I, I, I don't. I, I was very attracted to this uh, idea of uh, ADD, uh, you know, that uh, the, the string picture where gravity um, it, it, it's free to expand on all the volume of the extra dimensions and, uh, and, and we're not. And so it's, we, we think it's weak because we can't, we can't see all of it, so to speak. I mean, th th that, that picture says, uh, you know, the, the, the it, it's, not, it's not weak if you integrate over all along the region where it can go. It's it just that we're stuck in one place and we can't see really how strong gravity is. And that, 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 that was a very appealing idea to me, okay? But uh, so far there's no evidence for it. If I can take the opportunity, I'd like to ask about the other aspect of the story, namely that, uh, Practically all quantum theories predict corrections to the particle masses. Yeah. And particle masses appear in the role of charges. So do you see any connection between the fact that masses are being influenced by various interactions and, and the cancellation of those interactions like uh, electric interactions uh, cancel when we have neutral, electrically neutral objects, right. and yet the gravitational force remains. One could think that when everything cancels out, then the only possibility left is to tack something on the mass and, and say the, the masses must interact. Do, do you have any thought regarding the origin of that uh, mass proportionality of the gravitational force. I mean, in other words, they, masses appear like charges. All charges are renormalized, so to say, or influenced by interactions. And when you neutralize all kind of forces, you may be left with only correction to a mass. And then it would be the gravity. But I but I wonder if there is a, if anybody is thinking in those terms. I, I don't know. Uh, 
I can't really tell you, Stan, um, you know, that there's got to be something right now about uh, general relativity. And general relativity says that, you know, it's coupling to the energy. And so, so somehow you've got to make the energy very small. In other words, how, how do you do that? I found energy starts with the mass, okay? The, the smallest value of the mass is of the energy that the particle may have is the mass. I'm thinking of your example of electrically neutral. Uh, you know, the, it, it, it's neutral, but it still has energy. Yeah. And uh, so you haven't you haven't really, um, the, the neutron still has uh, electrostatic energy in it, right? From the quarks. Yes, but uh, that electrostatic energy would count as part of its rest energy, right? Oh, sure, 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 no. So in other words, he, he, its mass would be that energy divided by c squared, including everything. Right, right, right. Yeah, of course. So, so if the, if if the mass is corrected by all kinds of interactions due to various charges, if you have an object which is completely neutral with respect to all these uh, fields that feel the charges, they don't feel them anymore because the object is neutral. But because the corrections come to the mass there is still some effect left, which is, and the only option for that effect that is left is that it's gravity. I just wonder if, if, if you ever heard anybody talking that way. I haven't, I mean, it's an intriguing thing, but, but I haven't heard anyone talking about it. Uh, I see, thank you. There, can you think of any, any way to ever test the, the concept? Well, it, uh, that, that should be a very small effect. So, so these corrections that would count for gravity would have to be extremely small. And, and on the other hand, it would have to be the, the quantum theory. And, uh, and I don't have an example to discuss. No, I'm sorry. I just wondered if in the community of people discussing the gravitational uh, forces, Anybody thinks in terms of the mass correction? Well, well I, you answered my question. Thank you no, very much. No, I would tell you it is interesting, right? Because there is something that's uh, another mystery, uh, which is the dark energy, right? If you uh, if you believe uh, general relativity uh, and you believe quantum mechanics, uh, you know, QED and uh, field theories, there, there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of zero point energy. <laughs> and apparently it doesn't gravitate. Okay. So you say, I believe quantum mechanics, look, there are all these modes of the fields we've got, uh, you add them all up, it's, it's a huge energy, actually. Any non-gravitational experiment we do only depends on the change in that energy. Okay, the zero of it doesn't show up, okay, or Casimir or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. But but if you believe Einstein, uh, it, it, it still ought to gravitate, okay, that zero. Um, and it doesn't, okay. It, it, it gravitate, if it gravitates at all, it gravitates extremely weakly, right? 60 order of magnitude, 120 order of magnitude, I mean, depending on what you try to invent. But there is an example where something does get very small for a mysterious reason. Well, thank you for 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 presenting your 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 point of view on the issue I touched. Thank you very much. I don't want to hold you any any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Say bye bye now. Thank you. Bye bye. So uh, yes, Eric. I know you must have. You probably want to take a break. And everything. So yeah. I, so uh, just tell me. Uh, I see they are all. 
uh, it, it's uh, Steve Gervin and, uh, and David Moore. Uh, right. and and John, they have different, no, they're, they're all the same link. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh, yeah, that may be the case. I think that's the way it, it was done by a secretary. So, and what time does, let's see, uh, um, John comes next, is it, or Steve? Steve yeah, John came next, but he did actually talk for a we did Right, talk right, right, okay. All right. Then. Steve is at 6.30, okay, which would be 3.30 my time, which is uh, more than an hour from now. That's right. So you you could probably go and do whatever you like. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say goodbye so you can go and, and, and maybe grab a bite or whatever it is that you need to do. Uh, okay. okay. And then uh, you can connect later. But thanks again. Now, now before you go, though, Keith, to yeah. make this thing work here, what did you do? Oh, so what happened was um, apparently you were connecting with a Zoom link that was associated with your individual meetings with people, with me or with someone else. Whereas um, uh, the Zoom connection that I sent you by email, um, that was the Zoom link that worked for you. And after you I, but I didn't actually use the one you sent, I think I just used the other one, but anyway. Okay, that was what seemed to work for you. It worked perfectly. Be, be, okay, be, before, how about this, Keith, if you don't mind? Sure. I'll leave the meeting and then try to get back in just with okay. you. Just, sounds and, good. If that works, then that works. we're in, okay? Okay, sounds good. So Keith, I, th thank you for all your help. And I'm gonna leave the meeting and then I'm gonna try to get back in and see you. Understood, okay, gotcha. Great, thank you, Keith. Mm -hmm. So it seems to work. Seems to work. Can okay. you hear me? I can see you can hear you, so everything's fine. And so uh, then I'll be back at 3.30 my time uh, to talk with Steve. Okay, and thank you very much for the tip. I just wanted you to know that um, I'm probably going to read this with great care very soon to look to see what we can do about if, if there's something that can be done in connection with the Higgs. Uh, but having said that, uh, if you see Gordon Watts there, tell him I, I said hello. I don't know if you get to campus much, but Gordon. Well, I, no, we, you know, we, we're probably like you are, locked out of the university oh, for yeah. the night. That's right. Okay. Yeah, well, stay, stay healthy and safe, okay? Okay. And, I, and when I see Gordon, which I don't know when the next time will be, I'll tell him, okay? It's not that big a deal. So. Okay, great. All right. Take Thanks care. Thanks very much, Keith. Sure. Thanks, Eric.